Welcome to the Dr. Dad's Podcast, where a naturopath and chiropractor come together each week to share lifestyle medicine, health advice, and inspiring interviews with some of the top experts in health and wellness, bringing you the latest in nutrition, exercise, ancient healing, toxins and detox, your microbiome, mindset, hormones, brain, and much more. Stay tuned. We're going to teach you how to experience growth daily. Hey, everybody. This is Dr. David Wardy coming at you with Dr. Nicholas Jensen. My brother, how are you, man? Doing really well, buddy. Uh... Yeah, just uh, life is pretty good right now. Things are things are fun, and uh, yeah, I'm I'm doing well, and I'm excited for more conversations like the one we're having today about expanding our consciousness and tapping into that greater sense of purpose. Always so who, a fun topic. Man. Who's on the call? So we got a, we got an amazing guest today, man. We have Jonathan De Potter. He is the founder and CEO of Behold Retreats and advocates for elevating consciousness and working on ourselves as the most meaningful way to improve the world. As a thought leader in plant medicine, his priority is to guide others to maximize the benefits and to raise education and awareness on this subject. Um, Behold Retreats facilitates journeys for leaders, executives, and entrepreneurs to rapidly accelerate personal growth discover deeper purpose and to sustain the transformational benefits of plant medicine like ayahuasca, uh, psychos, am I saying this right? Psilocybin and San Pedro. Uh, Their programs provide you safety, confidence, and expert guidance to eliminate the guesswork with life-changing private and group retreats available in uh, idyllic locations. Uh, So prior to this, Jonathan worked as a strategy consultant at Accenture and Capco, supporting Fortune 500 companies with their digital strategy and technology transformations brother that was a mouthful but welcome man we're, we're really pumped to have you on with us today <laughs> thank you david uh yeah that is a that is a mouthful perhaps i'll shorten that for the future um yeah very excited to be here with the two of you and uh yeah excited to talk about plants and uh how how they can help us be even better than we are yeah I, 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 yeah go, go ahead david no, I'm excited. I know Nick has had some sort of, ex- you've already had some experience with a retreat like this, I believe, right? Yeah, I mean, mine mine was uh, based in North America. I'm, I'm just for the sake of um, privacy, I'm not going to say exactly where, just because this is a, a tender topic to discuss. But uh, mine was was uh, an experience that uh, that was really transformative. It was gentle and subtle and, and not what I was expecting based on all the stories that you hear. But uh, it was it was profound nonetheless. And so, why don't we like let's well, let's start off with like what is plant medicine? You know, is it just you know going into the garden and grabbing some uh, carrot shoots and kale and making a salad, or or you know, can can you expand on the role of plant medicine and what it's all about? Yeah. So when when we use the term plant medicine, it's you know I think it's all it's fair to say it's uh, it's an umbrella term. Um, but we're speaking about a group of plants that are described as uh, psychedelics or entheogens, right? Um, now we we prefer the term plant medicine because psychedelics carries with it. Uh, a certain degree of baggage. And so I'm, I'm based in Asia and uh, we have an opportunity here to take the language back a little bit uh, and to use terms like plant medicine. And, you know, in, in Asia, uh, the overwhelming majority of the, of the, the med- medicine traditions are, of course, plant-based. Uh, and so it's a very, you know, natural way for us to, to, to kind of ease in the conversation versus, you know, the, what we see in, in, say, North America, where, you know, there's people who are 100% for, there's a people who are 100% against, and, you know, there's, there's very few people who are kind of um, there in the middle. So when we're talking about plant medicine, you know, there's a massive variety of psychoactive or psychedelic uh, plant medicines out there, um, and that's generally underappreciated. But the, the most popular that people people are generally interested are number one, ayahuasca. Um, Certainly that's what we find in North America. Uh, And then a very distant second, I would say is psilocybin, uh, which is the magic mushrooms. Um, They're, I think, more easily accessible. And if you're just going to have some fun with with friends and often that's the choice. Um, And then third is uh, San Pedro, which is uh, is an amazing practice and and kind of an under underrepresented uh, plant medicine, to be honest, because it's a really uh, beautiful and and heart opening uh, experience. And, the, and this is just three of, of many, like there's Wachuma, there's peyote, there's Ibogaine, there's like there are Boga, I should say, there's, there's a whole lot of other plant medicines that, that have surfaced in all these different areas around the world. And, and so wh- why, why was it that uh, just these three in your guys' case, uh, why was it these three, uh, why did you focus in on, on these ones? 
Yeah, it's a, it's a good question to ask. Um, I think we will expand uh, with time. Um, there are different uh, medical considerations in relation to each of these medicines. Um, and so we wanted to start where the majority of the demand is, honestly speaking. Um, and also um, ayahuasca, psilocybin and San Pedro are considerably easier to work with than uh, than iboga. Um, I think iboga, you know, is a very powerful medicine. It's got a, you know, very specific, um, uh, a number of specific use cases that are, that are more popular. Um, but we didn't want to go there just yet. Uh, and then there's, you know, there's still a couple other plant medicines or, or medicines that are considered within this category that are even more powerful again. And, um, you know, I think the, the human condition is such that we like to go to the most extreme. Uh, but as this place, you know, as this, as this ecosystem warms up, uh, we're not necessarily encouraging people to start with the most extreme experiences. Um, and, 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 you know, that <laughs> because I just, you know, the analogy that comes to mind is, is launching the rocket ship without kind of having any sort of um, context through which to point it skywards. And so, yeah, we're trying to, you know, ease people towards these, these more intensive experiences rather than starting them off with a rocket ship. Mm. Yeah, I love that. Well, let's let's talk about a little bit about the stigma around uh, psychedelics and and plant medicine because I think some people, you know, again, maybe our audience, some people are are curious, they want to know more about it. Yet, um, there's this, you know, association to that's causing harm or it's or it's bad, it's it's unnatural, uh, though it you know obviously comes from nature. But uh, would would love to just hear how you guys help people understand this, even when they're coming to the retreat and there there's hesitancy around using plant medicine. Yeah, sure. Um, and uh, it's it's one that's easy for me to relate to. So I I grew up in Hawaii, and uh, a lot of substance use and abuse, uh, unfortunately, in Hawaii. And so from a young age, I saw a lot of negativity surrounding that, and and myself. Uh, never had any interest. So unfortunately, you know, friends of mine from age 11 and 12 were, were abusing substances. Um, and so I, I only saw negativity from that and, and removed myself from, from all of that. And, uh, yeah, it, it took a lot for me to overcome my skepticism and, and finally attend a plant medicine retreat with a couple of friends in Peru. Um, but what it, what it provided me was just incredible. You know, I was able to unlock, uh, previously suppressed and repressed, um, uh, experiences from my childhood that uh, that were manifesting in my character, right? So sometimes I could become quite impatient or frustrated or even angry, um, easily triggered by things that um, that one shouldn't be, honestly speaking. Uh, and I never really understood the reason for that. And by uncovering some of these uh, past experiences, was really able to overcome those character traits, um, which which has been such a blessing for me, just in terms of everyday happiness, right? And so, you know, I think to some degree. Uh, nerves and skepticism are healthy. Um, and, you know, people often ask me, you know, there's a lot of stuff going up on Netflix now um, around ayahuasca and you see, you know, say 50% of, uh, of an hour is dedicated to the, to the negative aspect. Uh, 50% is, is dedicated to the positive aspect. And I've always got friends asking me, you know, oh, isn't, isn't it such a pity that they did that? And it's like, no, I, I think that's absolutely the responsible thing to do. Um, yes, the overwhelming majority of people in the right context have positive experiences, but what we need to make people fully aware of the downside risks that, are, that can come with this work. And so very much always encourage people to take the time, if there is an interest, to take the time and the energy um, to understand the space for themselves. Uh, don't be motivated by the stories that they've heard from, from friends or from family. Uh, take the time and the energy to develop your own motivations. Uh, I think that's super important. Um, and then, and then some nerves are totally healthy going into an experience. Now, if I, I've had probably 40 ceremonies now over, over about five years, I am still nervous before going into each, each ceremony. And so, uh, it's, it's, you know, you're, you're entering the realm of the unknown, the spiritual, uh, and, and any adventure, uh, of, of a meaningful, yeah, any ad meaningful adventure should have a degree of nerves associated with it, right? That's kind of part and parcel core to the adventure itself. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Go ahead, David. Oh, no. So I'm curious, what kind of individuals do you guys see at your retreat centers? Like, what are you guys attracting as far as what are the goals with these people that show up and what are they trying to find through this process? Yeah, that's a good question. Thank you, David. Um, what 
I see playing out in the business world, and, and this also reflects the customers that we're attracting, is that people are being limited by the very same strength of mind that brought them success. Uh, and I think this applies particularly strongly to men. Um, so, you know, maybe you've, you've shot the lights out and you've had a really successful career and climbed the corporate ladder in some major organization, right? You get to a point where you've got your security and your mortgage and your, you know, maybe your kid's college and all of that sort of stuff taken care of. At that point, often people, um, often people are looking for a switch into deeper purpose, right? Um, I think there's another group of people who are often feeling stuck, right? So they've come up through the ranks, they've reached a particular level, and now they're, they're not able to move to the next level. Um, and it's, you know, it's their overly structured or overly regimented ways of thinking that are often preventing them from moving to the next level. And so they're looking for that breakthrough. They're looking to de-pattern some of their uh, overly ingrained or even perhaps deterministic sort of thinking. Um, so we're getting a lot of uh, kind of executives who I would say, you know, leaders and executives who are generally between 40 and 55 um, and they're ready for that next, you know, they're, they're ready for that next growth trajectory. Um, right. And, and often we've got, you know, patterns that have built up over decades in relation to how we relate to ourselves. Right. So, uh, some quite profound research out there that shows that, um, 95% of our thoughts are related about ourselves and 80% of those are negative. Just across the patch right and so beginning to de-pattern some of those those thinking habits that often are completely unconscious uh, right they're just they're happening on loop and they've been happening for so long we no longer see them and again those things are manifesting in terms of how you're showing up for your team how you're showing up for your family um, all of those things and so uh, you know we we take a very holistic approach in guiding clients three weeks before a retreat a one or two week retreat uh, and then three weeks after the retreat to really help them recognize and identify what are these limiting patterns what are these limiting beliefs uh and how can we begin to release those lower level emotions that might be associated with some of your uh, more challenging or traumatic experiences early in life so that you've got a bit more of a clean slate which will naturally lead to the next uh the next growth trajectory mm -hmm. i love the way you describe that and that's that's powerful for all of us to reflect on you know our level of joy or contentment with life or where we feel we're, we're stuck and so much of what shows up in our life is a result of how we're thinking about ourselves and how we're perceiving our environments. And, you know, I really, I really hear what you're saying and in, in that this is creating an opportunity for people to unveil some of those restrictions and step into a, a version of themselves that, that maybe they've forgotten about or they didn't realize were there. But so much of this habituation comes in from those early childhood years that, that, that do go just kind of dormant and they just go on autopilot and uh, I found that to be, you know, whether through plant medicine, through Kundalini Yoga, through, you know, just facing your obstacles and challenges, you know, maybe it's a Spartan race. All these different life experiences do create a new chemistry of, uh, of neuropeptides and hormones and flow state and, and basically an opportunity to recreate yourself in a new kind of way. Um, what are some of the, you know, like some of the stories or feedback that you get from people that are, you know, maybe they came in going like, Jesus is kind of scary. This is totally out of my realm of normalcy. Um, you know, maybe talk about some of those nerves and, and some of those common questions that people have. And then, and then what are some of the stories uh, that you get to hear about people going through this process? Yeah, I'll, I'll first share a story because it's, it's just immediately came to mind as, as you were speaking there. And then I'll, I'll, I'll wind back to the questions that people commonly ask. Um, so we had, uh, we did a, a, an incredible beachfront Tulum retreat, private retreat for, um, for a Texas CEO. Um, and uh, this was the second retreat actually that we, that we facilitated for him. And, uh, you know, before, when we first started working with him, he was, uh, um, you know, just, Texas CEO sort of energy, right? He had uh, a lot going on in his life. He had maybe some ladies in different cities. Uh, he was traveling around the globe all the time. Um, he was a big hunter, right? Really enjoyed hunting uh, and had a lot of dead animals on the wall. Uh, <laughs> and uh, and so um, we sent him on a retreat. His first retreat was with in, in Ecuador with an ethnobotanist that we work very closely with. And after one week, he said, all right, simplifying the life down, just one lady, um, going to stop hunting. Uh, and would like to bring my hunting buddies on a retreat 
And I would also uh, like to set up a foundation with the proceeds going to this sort of work. I was like, wow, okay, that was, wow. that was one retreat. Uh, and the, the, on the second retreat that we, um, that we facilitated him, he actually uh, connected really well with one of the maids that was there at the retreat. And, uh, and decided, you know, on the, on the, I think it was on the fifth day, um, decided, you know, through conversations with her, uh, that she sh maybe might like to join one of the ceremonies. So he actually invited her into a ceremony and she just had this tr tremendous breakthrough, uh, in the ceremony. And I just, you know, I just really, I really like that story because it's just evidence of the sort of energy that we'd like to bring more of into this world, which is not the, you know, lots of, you know, lots of hidden ladies around the world and, you know, shooting animals and, but actually like, you know, living the love, right. And being like, all right, here's a person who I've really connected with. It seems like, you know, she might like to be involved in this and, and helping her with her breakthrough and, and setting up a foundation for the plant that is like, wow, okay. That's, that's incredible that we can have that sort of, uh, that sort of an impact. You know, we're still a new business, but those sorts of stories are so motivating, right? And we've got, um, you know, uh, a good, a good handful of those sorts of stories now, which is just, yeah, which is so motivating. Um, but yeah, back to, uh, back to the common questions. Um, you know, safety is a big one. Um, and, uh, I'll share, I'll share a funny story in relation to that. So one of our advisors who designed our medical guidelines, um, she went and dug through all of the Harvard literature, you know, Harvard's basically got every, every medical piece that's ever been written on the, on the topic of ayahuasca for our ayahuasca guidelines. And, um, and through that process, she said, you know, there's two medicines here that everyone has on their website that aren't real medicines. And I said, I'm sorry, I, I'm not sure I understand. And she said, these, there's these two medicines that only appear on ayahuasca contraindicated lists. These are not two actual prescribed medicines. They don't exist in the real world. I was like, oh, how interesting. So what's clearly happened is that some retreat center has put up a list and either knowingly or unknowingly included these two medicines. And it seems like somehow that's just propagated across the other many, many retreat centers. And so, you know, again, these, these retreat centers are doing the, the work as, you know, at the highest level that they can, but they don't necessarily have the time, the energy and the resources to keep up with the latest contraindications, et cetera. Right. So safety is a real concern in relation to this work. The, um, the second, the second sets of questions that we get are often in relation to uh, what's going to happen, right? Uh, people, uh, people are obviously feeling vulnerable. They're, they're feeling, um, yeah, they're feeling a little bit nervous, right? Um, and, uh, and the honest answer, the only honest answer in relation to this is we don't know. Um, of course, you know, you, you frame it slightly differently to that. Um, but if you ask someone who's been working in this space for 30 years, been doing three or four ceremonies every week for, for 30 years, and you ask them, hey, what's going to happen tonight? Even though they're working with in the same place with the same medicine, da, 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 they're going to look at you and they're going to say, we don't know. Um, and, it's, and it's just the nature of this work, right? It's, it's energetic work. It's spiritual work. Um, and, uh, and so it's unpredictable in that way. So uh, those, are, those are kind of two of the categories. I think a lot often um, people want to know um, a, a lot more about the benefits and the neurology as well. So I often find myself spending quite a bit of time, you know, especially the business leaders. The, you know, these are rational driven people. They like to know the science and the, 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 the facts, as it were. And so uh, often speaking about the neurology, which I think is, is particularly compelling. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love it. Go ahead, David. I'd love to hear more about the neurogenesis aspect of how these medicines are affecting us for these breakthroughs, if you can speak a little bit to that. Yeah, sure. Um, so there's three, so the, the, the way I often frame this is there's three, at least three reasons that I see that we benefit from this. The first is that we all have past traumatic or challenging experiences in life, which has led to limiting beliefs often. Um, you know, people say things like, oh, I'm not good with numbers or uh, I can't do this or I don't have enough money. All of these things are just limiting beliefs, right? Um, the second is that uh, we are overwhelmed by the modern world. There's so much happening in our personal and professional lives that we can't possibly... Um, process all of the all of the stimulus that's coming at us and so what tends to happen is that we begin to take shortcuts in our thinking patterns and while that sounds like a uh, positive adaptive response or energy efficient mechanism to just deal with everything that's going on what actually tends to happen is that we come to use a very small subset of our neural pathways so we're actually doing very 
we're doing damage to the software of our brain. Um, and so this is what leads to overly patterned thinking and behavior to, to, to a great extent. Now, the third is um, what you guys may, may have heard of before is, is, is commonly described as the default mode network. Now, the default mode network is responsible for those I, me, my thoughts, which, as I mentioned before, 90, 95% of thinking. Uh, and they're also responsible for any thoughts that are not grounded in the present, right? So uh, drifting off into the past, which is often for many a form of depression, drifting off into the future, uh, anxiety inducing for many. Um, and so um, plant medicine dampens down the default mode network, uh, which is kind of the ego of the brain. Um, and, and through dampening down the default mode network, what we see in the brain is this massive reconciliation, right? Where all parts of the brain with the neurogenesis, right? So the creation of new neurons, the creation of new neuronal connections, what we can see is that all regions of the brain are now able to access all other regions of the brain. So that's when a lot of memories can become unlocked. That's when we have, you know, if we've got incongruent thoughts uh, where, you know, I love my wife over here and I'm cheating on my wife over there, um, those, cannot, those, those, those two thoughts cannot coexist um, in a, in a coherent brain. And so that's, you know, part of the reason that people have these breakthroughs is that there's this reconciliation that's taking place so that the brain is in coherence with itself. Uh, and then, and then further to that, it's also the brain regaining coherence with the heart and, and the body more broadly. But, um, you know, early, early in the journeys for people, usually it's about rebuilding coherence in the brain. Uh, and that's, I mean, physically, emotionally, and spiritually, those, that happening across your brain is like, Wow, that's it's pretty profound as you might as you might imagine. It sounds like and it sounds like Nicholas knows. <laughs> well, I'm picturing like when you used to defragment the hard drive or the computer, right? Like you're going back and you're just trying to clean things up. That makes complete sense to me. So it's just like getting this hard reboot. And the coherence aspect, man, I bet the the awareness when you come out of an experience like that with your overall perspective of where you're at in life is probably pretty incredible. It is. It is. And, you know, the, the, I was saying before, just before we started recording, it's, uh, you know, people come out of these retreats feeling five stars and, and their reviews of these uh, experiences reflect that um, five stars across the board. Now, the challenging work or the gap, as it were, is commonly between the end of a retreat and about a month later where you're flipping that guy off in traffic um, and just back to your normal self 100%. Uh, and so the real challenge is, is committing to and doing the integration work. Uh, to a high standard such that you're not back at a retreat center six weeks later saying, I know there's more here. I'm going to go do this again. Uh, but that each retreat actually serves as a foundation to really improve the quality of everyday life. And that's really uh, what we're trying to do differently at Behold Retreats is that people don't slip back into those patterns and come uh, back in a short space of time uh, for another experience that they've actually been able to, to level up, as it were. Mm hmm yeah, that's par that's powerful information because I mean, I mean, we've I mean, Dave and I've been on retreats together a couple, and you know, we I think when you don't uh, put enough emphasis on that integration process that happens, it's so easy to go back into those old patterns because you know, at the end of the day, you know, whether you're skydiving or having a, a, a journey with ayahuasca or at a yoga retreat. Uh, all of those are going to induce this this brain chemistry, this 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 new experience that that mm -hmm. becomes a platform for learning and and growth and development. And uh, an integration isn't given enough thought because it's so common that we go back into these fast based type. Like you mentioned, the modern world that in and of itself becomes a, a recurring source of you know tra trauma or or difficulty <laughs> for people, right? And, uh, but you do come back with a little more resilience and you still need to integrate. So I'd love to hear about some of the supplemental protocol that you guys implement. Like obviously it doesn't have to be in great amount of detail, but you had, you said that there's this lead in, which I think is super important. So you get people thinking, get the juices flowing, you know, get some of that, you know, coherence already happening by the time they get to the retreat. And then, but if you could kind of talk about that journey, cause you said it's a seven week process essentially, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so what, so there's a lot of mistakes happening in relation to this work that I that I now understand. So I'll, I'll dive into a few of them. So the first is, you know, often people come into these retreats with um, with intentions that are perhaps not 
the right ones for them. Um, and, and often that's because they've skipped the associated mental and emotional work. So what I see works best for our clients is um, we step them through a preparation process uh, and asking them a series of questions, which really highlights Number one, their, their negative thinking patterns. Number two, their beliefs, uh, limiting beliefs. So once you see those and you've written them down and you look at those and you're looking at those on a regular basis, you become much more conscious of when those things are playing out in your, in your everyday life. Um, and then, and then some one, some quality one to one time group, group coaching or, and or one to one time so that people can really talk through those and they can see those things for what they are, which is, you're having a thought, right? Or you're, you're making a judgment about yourself or that's negative self-talk. It's um, words like should or words like, oh, you know, I, I earlier in life, this, that, and the other. Um, and so getting people to actually begin to release some of those lower level emotions, right? So um, begin to itemize. What are those experiences earlier in life that might've had some trauma or some negativity associated with them, right? Was it that bullying in school or um, the end of a relationship that you were really hopeful for or you know, experiences with your parents, whatever it is that it might be. Now, by, by providing some tooling for people to actually begin to release those lower level emotions, um, then, then a great amount of progress can be made while on retreat. So one of the things that I, I see is now happening on these retreats is that people come into um, the retreats with forward-looking intentions, you know, around say, oh, I want to take my career to the next level or I want more clarity on my uh, on what I should do from a work perspective or my relationships or whatever. But they're, but they're missing the stuff that's holding them back, the stuff they're missing the stuff that's anchoring them. Right. And so often they're going on retreat. They're having this blast off. They're getting some insights that are, that are powerful for sure. Um, but they're not able to let go those, those anchoring beliefs and emotions. And so they'll, you know, achieve some higher le level of consciousness, but often land back where they were. Uh, and that's because they haven't been able to let go of some of that lower, lower level stuff. And so, you know, it's, it's, um, People who've guided hundreds, preferably thousands of clients over decades are very well equipped to corner the ego, uh, as it were, in, in for the ego. Because, you know, the mind doesn't like to, to see its condition, its life condition in a different light than it is, right? Because we have reasons, we have rationale for why life is the way it is for us and we don't like to get out of our story and so for for someone who can really <laughs> kind of corner uh, corner the ego and say look this is just a story you're telling yourselves it does it, it's challenging one but two it can really lead to significant breakthroughs ahead of the retreats uh which is which is what we love to provide right where clients are going uh you know two weeks in or three weeks in they've already had major emotional breakthroughs uh and now they're able to really make massive progress uh while they're on retreat and so um yeah what we're i mean the the outcome that we're searching for is really an elevated state of consciousness as the as the stable state uh post retreat and being able to integrate that so that it's sustained so um you know becoming aware of those patterns of behavior uh of with whether it's with food or with media usage technology you know we've got so many of these patterns that we just don't even we don't even we pick up without even thinking about it, right? It's just, of course, I'm picking up my phone. Like <laughs> I do it 300 times a day. What's the problem? Uh, and so, and so, just helping people be like, okay, so why are you picking up your phone? Oh, it's because I'm having an emotion, and like having the emotion, and so I'm going to pick up my phone because there's plenty in here to keep me distracted. <laughs> uh, and it's like, okay, well, here's you know, here's some tools to do emotional release. The next time you want to pick up your phone, stop, feel, do the emotional release. Oh, I don't really need to pick up my phone now. Let's continue the conversation because uh, I was I was just trying to actually remove myself emotionally from the conversation. So these sorts of things can really help. And then you know the integration process is really about okay, so what did you experience? Um, and okay, maybe it's universal love. Okay, that's a, that's a common breakthrough. Um, now, how do we integrate that experience into our into our daily life? What does that mean for how you're going to show up for your team? How does that mean for how you're going to show up to um, the people who do trigger? Uh, you in your life. And, and so, you know, all of those sorts of things can begin to shift um, as people take the time and the energy. And, you know, that's a large part of the integration is just committing to that hour in the morning um, to review the breakthroughs and the commitments that you made to yourself and to see how you're holding up against them. Right. And so uh, 
I don't know, want to call it a report card, but something like that to say like, no, I, I wasn't loving today. Um, and here's, here's the four ways that I should have been loving and I wasn't. And here's what I'm going to do about it tomorrow and dust yourselves off and, uh, and go again. That's so important, man, that, you know, I, like Nick was saying, I've been through this whole integration piece and I really didn't know what to expect on my first retreat. And the way you guys are doing it from this introduction to the actual retreat to the, you know, post retreat to help them make move their way through, create some understanding there so that they can make this a permanent change, right? Like, like you were saying before, I mean, we could all do a million retreats, but it's probably the quality of the process that you're moving through during that any retreat that you do so that that outcome comes. You know, and it's funny, I'm listening to you. I always tell my patients when they go through surgeries, I say, look, one of the biggest things is going to be like your rehab post-surgery. So I'm hearing you talk about this. And yeah, that experience, I'm sure, is life changing when you go to the retreat center and you, you do the plant medicine stuff. But it's everything that's happening afterwards, that I think, that you have to maximize on to make sure that you're getting the most out of that experience. Absolutely. And, you know, it's common for people to actually have a dip after one of these experiences, right? Because they've had this universal love experience, right? And, and of course, our experience is subjective. It's relative. And so now they're back where they were before, but they know that this is achievable. And they're like, ah, oh. and so there's, you know, they can actually feel like the gap is, is more rather than, than, than less. So, um, yeah, it's, there's, there's a lot to integrate. The other, the other aspect of this is, that, you know, as I was speaking about before, it's very common for people to unlock um, uh, very challenging experiences from earlier in life. And often people have an instinct to share that experience, say with parents, if there was, you know, if the parents traumatize the child in some way. I'm going to go tell my parents what they did to me. And it's like, yeah, that's really not what this is about. So first we let's integrate this into your character. Um, once it feels fully integrated into your character, you probably feel very differently about what you'd like to do as next steps. Um, and so just guiding people towards um, sensible decisions, right? You know, I'm going to quit my job or I'm going to, you know, major life decisions coming out of a retreat. It's like, yeah, okay, let's integrate what you felt, what you saw into the experience. Let's not, let's not diminish the power of the experience, right? But let's integrate that into your character before we make um, big decisions about life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that you said that because it, <clears throat> that's, that's so common, commonly the case, right? It's that we, we get this taste of something bigger, some, this expansive uh, feeling that, that that's generated as a result of the experience. And it's, it's really, you know, you think that, yeah, you need to make all those massive decisions when you come back home. But like, just as we sit with, um, unknowingly sit with the discomfort of life, can we sit the discomfort, can we sit with the discomfort of coming back and just be okay with the fact mm -hmm. that this is how life has pl played out to this point in time? What are some of these steps that I can implement now and be comfortable with with where I'm at? Because at the, at the end of the day, like going through a process like this in my own experience, it was nothing but I mean, it was it was lots of things. But one of the things that became so apparent was just the, the frequency of being in this present state of awareness that was just so profoundly powerful mm -hmm. and so gentle and sweet and and it was completely, for me, the complete opposite of what I was expecting with the, the purging and all the, you know, the, the wailing or like the, the discomfort that you might, you know, might imagine. And, and I remember <laughs> thoroughly enjoying the flavor of this, this uh, medicine and, and really just being fully embraced by the experience and, and also recognizing that I wasn't out of control. I wasn't, it wasn't a loss of control, but where, where I, where I was being pulled um, or where I noticed where I was being pulled was wherever my attention was, was grasping for a certain outcome. And it was really, you know, this, this sort of uh, embrace of just letting that which needs to happen, happen. And I think that, you know, an mm. energy or an experience like this after the fact is what if you could hold that same experience as you move forward in your life and just trust this embrace of a present moment and how can I be with what is so that, you know, what's to come is not the focus, but it's just, it's, it's or my experience of this, of this place. And, th and that, you know, I think that the beauty of that for us all is to, 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 that is the, how we release this stigma of things have to happen a certain way. They have to happen with this type of medicine. I need, I'm very curious. I want to, you know, move towards this experience, but at the end of the day, I think we get to know ourselves through this, this present state awareness. That's just so, so beautiful. 
I love that. That's powerful. That's powerful. And, and yeah, I think the more that we can release ourselves from those expectations and be, be here, be, be now, I mean, that's, it's incredible. The, the joy and the bliss and yeah, the, the completeness of every unfolding second once we can recognize that for what it is, as opposed to constantly, you know, the Western world has just programmed us so incredibly to live in the gap, right? Um, and, you know, it, it's, it's whether it's the apartment on Mars or whatever's next, you know, you can't win that game. Like, you just can't possibly reach that point where you go, now I have enough money or now I have enough this that I'm happy. The, the brain doesn't work that way. It's, it's in such a unhelpful pattern of wanting that the moment it achieves, it just resets the bar. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, it's incredible to write these things. I I've begun to write these things down so that I can see when my brain's doing these things and I can see when my brain is actually changing the game. Right. And you go, no, you're, you're shifting the goalposts again. Right. And, uh, and I, I work with a lot of my friends, a lot of my friends, we've started to do this together so that we can see how we shift the goalposts. And it's like, yeah, but, and it's like, no, you're, you're shifting the goalposts on yourself. And so just to, just to, you know, approach this with a degree of humor, right. Because, uh, watching your mind and, and the insanity that can come from it is, uh, is, is humorous. <laughs> so true. You know, as you're speaking, I'm, I'm thinking, you know, some of the different people tuning into the podcast and some of the questions that they may have. And, and uh, I'm, I, first of all, I love everything you're sharing. I think it's just so, you know, eloquently articulated and it's, it's just really beautiful and it really, and it's very inviting because it doesn't sound scary or woo woo or um, it really, it comes down to very practical terms. I mean, the way that you're describing it and uh but one, one question I do have is, is in this world of, you know, we work, we work with a lot of people in recovery and um, there's this, uh, uh, um, I guess this not attachment, but this recognition of an addictive nature and anything that's of substance, you know, can recycle that experience for people, you know, should they open themselves to plant medicine. And, and I, when I work with people, it, I, it matters not to me which direction they go to find their state of, you know, peace and contentment and joy. But um, I'm mm. curious if you've met some people in this experience that are on a journey of recovery and, uh, and what they've found for themselves and going through this process. Yeah. Um, that's, that's an interesting question because, uh, we, we have, we do get a lot of clients that are on a recovery journey, um, reaching out to us. Um, the more, the more intensive cases, we are not necessarily in a position to take ourselves. Um, but we do, we do refer, of course. Um, what's, what surprised me actually is the extent to which ayahuasca in particular seems to be finding its way into conversations in AA circles. Um, uh, and, um, you know, I think it's, it's interesting for a few, a few reasons. Um, one is, you know, AA, as I understand it, I'm, I'm not a, an expert in, in any way, shape or form, but I understand that it often has a, a religious context or a religious association with it. Um, and so to see that ayahuasca is there is, is kind of interesting to see and, and quite unexpected, uh, actually. Um, but I think there's, there's a few things that immediately come to mind in terms of people who might be considering this as part of a recovery journey. The first is um, these plants are considered to be non-addictive, right? And that's a, that's a medical um, distinction, as I understand it, is that you know, the medical world recognizes that these, these substances are not addictive, which is you do not wake up the next morning after an experience and think, boy, love to do that again today and tomorrow, the next day. It's just, it doesn't have that sort of association. Now, there are people who do come to, to abuse these substances, right? And that's worth recognizing. Uh, and generally speaking, they are doing so to escape. Um, so that is a, it is a risk, right? That, that is worth recognizing. Um, the, it's also worth mentioning that, um, you know, in the U.S., for example, MDMA looks like it's going to be the first that crosses the line from from a legalization perspective. Now, MDMA does have uh, and ketamine as well is, is already across the line in a number of places. Now, those are two psychoactive substances, not psychedelic substances, but both of those do have uh, addictive risks associated, you know, more risk associated with them from an addictive perspective. Um 
So, um, you know, I think back to the more positive side, uh, generally speaking, people see um, these these plants as additive to their recovery journey because they're, they're having insights in relation to self-discovery and self-understanding and greater empathy for themselves, which, which is, you know, part of what's leading them to, um, to reduce their, their substance abuse or, or remove their substance abuse. You know, as, as I shared with you before we started the call, you know, I used to drink quite a bit. Uh, I was working in consulting in Hong Kong. Um, and, and now I don't touch a drop and, and probably will never again for the rest of my life because it's just, I now see that it's, it only reduces my quality of experience, uh, not improves my quality of experience. Uh, whereas before it was, it was something that I saw as improving my quality of experience, of course, because why else would I do it? Um, and so as, as we become more conscious of our physical state, as well as our mental and emotional state we can begin to feel more directly and associate more directly the impact of, you know, a given thing on our being, right? So whether that be unhealthy food, whether that be um, substances that don't serve us, whether that be alcohol, whether that be pornography, uh, media usage, uh, we, be, we become far more sensitive to um, the impact or the relationship between what we're doing and how we feel. Uh, and so with that, we be, and, and journaling helps a lot in relation to this in terms of just being far more um, yeah, reflective about, oh, I did this and then I felt that so that, so that it can really, yeah, it can really move people forward in terms of their, their recovery and their, and their joy for life ultimately. Yeah, I love, that, was, that was an amazing answer. And I love how you highlighted the point that there is plenty of information to show that these are not addictive substances and it's not replacing one thing for another. But you also mentioned something extremely important, that's intention. So I'd love to, for you to sort of speak to that, that intention. And, and the thing that's tied to this in ceremony is that sacred space. You know, it's a completely different environment than like, hey, guys, I got a joint. Let's go smoke this or outside, you know, uh, around, around the building over yeah. there. You know, it's safe. It's like we'll have a fun time. I mean, completely, completely different energetics uh, in relationship to how these, you know, these ceremonies, these, these sacred spaces are set up. And can you, can you speak to some of that in relation to intention? Yeah, and I think you, you've touched on a key point there, Nicholas, that, that I should have, which is, um separating yourself from these experiences to to a great extent is important and what i mean by that is that it's not a hey come on over and let's do this um, it should not be treated so casually uh absolutely not it, you know preferably remove yourself entirely from your context right if you're in a financial position to do so change locations completely um so that you've got a week to yourself, ideally, to go deep, you know, disconnect from media, disconnect from all of those normal things so that you can just spend that time uh, with, with yourself. So, yeah, I mean, I think setting, setting intentions is such a, a meaningful component of this and having expert guidance is really um, what can make the difference in terms of setting the right intentions, right? So, um, just having someone who is a bit of a mirror to help you take stock of your life um, for what it is um, in terms of where you're at uh, across the many dimensions of life um, so that you can really say, well, I think, you know, so someone can say, well, what about, you know, maybe opening your heart or maybe something in relation to letting go of these past traumatic experiences, et cetera, you know, uh, maybe a, a, a self-abusive patterns, these sorts of things. And so we can really kind of narrow in on, on what are the right intentions so that you're coming into that with, with a clear ask, right? And cause that's, that's kind of what you're doing. You're kind of, you might even kind of associate it to a great extent with prayer. You're coming in with a prayer and you're asking to, in your expanded state of consciousness, for your prayer to be answered. Um, and so, you know, you want to bring that prayer in with a really deeply felt in, intention behind it so that, um, so, that, so that you can make progress uh, along your goal. And, you know, I think there's a couple dynamics in relation to this that, that I encourage people to think about, which is one, um, keeping your intention, finding the right balance between keeping your intention present and allowing the experience to unfold. Right. And there's no, um, there's no right and wrong here. It's just that you can have five hour, a five hour experience 
and, and make zero progress towards your intention. That's very possible. And equally, you can sit there and repeat your intention to yourself and have a really, you know, <laughs> an experience that is limited uh, in its uh, in its in its ability to unfold. Uh, and so this is a you know, it's about finding the right energetic flow um, through the experience. Uh, and then in relation to that, you know, people often, um, some people are so busy writing everything that happens down that they're not allowing the experience to unfold. Other people, again, they have a five hour ceremony and you ask them, Oh, what were the lessons? They go, Oh, geez. So there was so many of them that I just can't remember. (laughs) And so again, it's about, there's no right and wrong answer. It's just about being conscious that there are trade-offs here to be made. And so, uh, you might, if you have a really big breakthrough that, and you think that you're, you know, you're 30 minutes into the experience, maybe, Take a minute, you know, take 30 seconds, scribble a few things down and then, you know, because there might be another 30 that are coming behind it. So uh, you want to you want to find the right balance in relation to the experience itself with with your intentions and, and what you bring out of it. Awesome. Go ahead, David. Well, I'm just thinking what an, what a journey to take. I mean, there's there's probably so many individuals that this is something they probably thought about for a very long time. I know me and my wife have talk, talked about it on and off about doing a retreat like this for ourselves down the road. Um, but I can't help but think as we're talking, just this whole, Uh this whole process almost of just completely letting go. Right. I mean, you're, you're showing up and you guys take an individual through this experience and you're, you're helping them get to that state of that climax point, right. During this process. And then there's this massive amount of healing that follows in this upgrading consciousness and, and man, I mean, I mean, with all the things that are happening right now in modern science and what we're learning and, and this, this, this journey of people to just raise this consciousness as a whole, this has got to be something that I'm, I'm guessing probably within the next, I don't know, five years is going to be pretty, pretty mainstream or getting there because I know just in the past decade, it's gained a lot of traction, but it kind of seems like it's getting more and more popular uh, every year as of late. Yeah. Yeah, it is. And it's going to be interesting, shall we say, because there's a lot of different energies that are very motivated to add to the space um, or, or extract from this space, uh, as it were. And so, um, yeah, I think what we're seeing now is just a, an explosion of, of demand uh, and ex- an explosion of business interests. And what's been interesting as I've been speaking to a lot of the industry leaders is to understand that um, I think I see now that the majority of people who are investing heavily in this space have never gone on an ayahuasca retreat, which is pretty <laughs> incredible. Uh, and so there's this, there's this disconnect that's happening in what should be a connected industry, perhaps the <laughs> spiritually connected industry. Uh, and I'm like, okay, so you've never had a retreat? No, I, you know, I took this once at a festival. And it's like, wow. And, and this is much more common than you might expect uh, within people who are in uh, big roles at some of the emerging innovation, you know, innovative uh, psychedelic companies, shall we say. Yeah, no, I totally agree with you. And I mean, it just goes to show like there's, there's corporate interest, there's financial, you know, gain to be had. And, and that, that becomes the, the mode of, you know, entry. And at the end of the day, like, you know, if these people ended up going through a retreat process, their, their whole shift in reality may end up changing and they, they look for harmony instead of, uh, you know, always looking for that opportunity. Um, love it. Uh, we, listen, I mean, people are probably just, you know, chomping at the bit. How do we find out more about your specific retreat? Uh, it's called, I mean, your, your program, your facilitation uh, it happens in different parts of the world, but it's called Behold Retreats. But if you can tell us a little bit more how people can access the information and, uh, and, and where, where to send them. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So we're at behold-retreats.com. Um, and, uh, yeah, we're, we're, we're here to help. We're here to answer questions. Um, you know, we, this topic is such a deep one, uh, right? So it's, it, we've, we've scratched the surface. I'd love to come back, you know, another time and, and do another chat with you guys and, and go oh, deeper bet. on, on, on an area. Maybe con- we can do consciousness because I think that's a, that's a good one. Um, and, uh, yeah, so, so we're, you know, we're, we're here to help. We've got beautiful, beautiful retreats available. Um, but we actually de-emphasize the retreat component. You know, we've called ourselves behold retreats, but it's like, look, the retreat is just a tool. Um, and it's a powerful one. Right. And, uh, it's been interesting as we've been in lockdown, 
we're having a lot of our clients are having major shifts before their retreats uh, and we're extending some of our programs so that they can continue to do the mental and emotional work because that's really what this is about this is about everyday waking consciousness it's it's not about a, a really powerful blast off um we can facilitate the blast off that's you know we're, we're for that totally um but but ultimately it's about um every day being more loving more joyful more peaceful and that's uh that's something that absolutely everyone everyone can experience so that's what we're that's what we're motivated and passionate about and, and spreading the love so good yeah and we definitely look forward to more conversations i mean when when i open up your your website i saw the the hawkins map of consciousness and we actually just got off a podcast a few weeks ago with uh guys from a company called flfe focus life force energy and their whole technology is actually based on that uh that harmony of of um a frequency and 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 so anyways it, it was cool seeing that resonance in your in in your sharings um and with social media is there places for people to follow you guys too to, to keep track of what you're doing yeah, we're on we're on LinkedIn and uh, Facebook and Instagram. Behold Retreats, uh, be able to find us there. Um, but uh, but yeah, it's uh, it's you know that, that that consciousness, the map of consciousness, is profound. Like I live my life by that map now, um, and uh, it's it's you know because we can all place ourselves on that map, which is what makes it so powerful. So yeah, looking forward to uh, a second chat. Would be super excited, uh, and uh, it's been really a pleasure. Jonathan, this has been great, man. Appreciate you, man. Yeah, thanks Thank so you, much. David. Thank you, Nicholas. Real pleasure. See you. See you on the next one. Beautiful. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed today's podcast, please be sure to subscribe to the Dr. Dads and share with your family and friends. You can also follow and interact with Dr. Nick and Dr. David on Facebook and Instagram for a daily dose of inspiration and the latest in health and wellness. Be well.